Um, so I'm going to try and give, uh, give you guys an idea of what process engineering is. My name is Ashvin uh, Thambaya. I'm, I'm uh, head of department of uh, the chemical and materials engineering department. And uh, I've been here with the university for about 15 years. Uh, my background tends to be more in bioengineering. We've got a very diverse uh, group of uh, engineers working in the department. And um, process engineering is something we teach. So let's start. Um, let's start with this picture. This is, this is World War. This is a picture from World War I. How many of you remember World War I? But what was the biggest killer in World War One? What? Yes, you. Okay, not big, big killer, but not the biggest. Anybody else? Yes? Gas. Um, my wife tells me. Oh, okay. No, uh, okay. Uh, big killer, not the biggest. Flu. Okay, it was around that period of time. But, was that? Infection. Okay? People died because there was no way to stop the horror of infection. So, World War I. Now, do you know this guy? Okay, Alexander Fleming. He, um, in St. Mary's Hospital. Anybody been to London and seen St. Mary's Hospital? It's there. They still, they still have this little section where he's had, they, they, they tried to preserve that, that whole uh, place where he, he discovered, what did he discover? Penicillin. It's Mary Software, ne next to Paddington Station. What's Paddington Station famous for? The bed. Okay, leave it. Okay, so Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, and um, this is a replica of the dish. So, so he, he went on holiday, like all academics do, uh, they, and, and um, a long holiday. And uh, he left, so he left this dish with all these colonies of bacteria. And when he came back, he found that there was this mold that had grown. And surrounding this mold was a region where all the bacteria colonies had died. And he thought, OK. There's something going on here. Something's killing the bacteria. And he called it, what do you call it? No, he called it mold juice. Liter he called it mold juice, yuck. But anyway, <laughs> it was only later he called it penicillin. So this mold juice, okay, was the one that was killing the bacteria. So in World War II, became the first war since records began where bacterial infection was not the leading cause of death. So how did we get, so basically that dish, so the medics took that dish and slapped it onto a wound. No, it doesn't work that way. So how, how did we get from that dish with the mold juice to 100 billion units of penicillin per month. That's process engineering. Okay? So Pfizer was, was involved as well. And it's not just a case of, hey, you know, we're going to get this juice, we're going to dry it up, we're going to get some powder, we're going to. It's not as, as easy as that. And to quote an executive, the mold is as temperamental as an opera singer. I didn't know they were temperamental, but never mind. The yields are low, so it's very, very tiny bit in a large vat. So you need to actually try and um, consider, you know, the yield. Um, the extraction is murder. Murder. Okay. The purification invites disaster, and the assay is unsatisfactory. So lots of challenges, and um, basically, it's 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 really to upscale going into bigger and bigger fermentation tanks and eventually producing that powder. And, and, and a person who was, who was crucial in, in um, uh, developing the technology for uh, um, making penicillin was, was Margaret Russo. And um, she, she designed the um, uh, first uh, deep tank fermentation 
uh, method for, for, for developing, for processing the mold. So, and like every superhero, she has a cape. <laughs> so, this is a, a modern process flow diagram for penicillin. You've got all the heat control units, uh, the, the spray drying, the, 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 the crystallization, etc. And all of this is something you would learn in this course, and it'll look as difficult as this, but after you take this course, it'll look as simple as this. <laughs> so, so basically, we, 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 we look at all the different processes and how to optimize it. It's, it's, it's considering uh, heat, mass balances, etc. Okay? Another person, Henry Besseman, who was, so steel, steel is a great material. <coughs> because of steel, <coughs> the Industrial Revolution could go on. Right? So to produce steel back then was really, really expensive. What's, uh, what's great about steel? It's, it's, it's hard, it's ductile, it lasts long, it doesn't rust as easy as wrought iron. So, Sir Henry uh, stole the techniques from the Chinese and the Japanese. No, anyway, he patented a technique. He, he, he refined a technique to actually make steel cheaply. Okay. And, and, and uh, although we don't use that technique, it, the, the idea no, now is a, is, a, is a more refined method of processing steel, but he was the, he was the, the first to find a way of making steel economically sustainable. Okay. So, so that's something else that process engineers are constantly looking at doing. Sustainable engineering, which means, so have you heard of sustainable engineering? You would have thought about, uh, you, you would have heard of that concept uh, in schools, in, in high school, do you discuss anything about sustainability? Yeah, a little bit. So sustainability, you know, in the, in the, in the oldies it used to be um, let's look for a better life. Let's create a way to create a better life. And that should be sustainable. And, and there are factors that come into consideration. In the, in, in, at some point, the priorities may be economic viability, that the company or a process plant may have to be economically viable as years go by. But now there are other considerations um, when we think about the resources and best use of resources. So process engineers are, are constantly looking at all these variables to try and um, <coughs> develop techniques that, that help us all. This is another example of process engineering. Um, back in the 1800s in the, in the farms, there used to be this, this black stuff that used to come out of the, of, of the ground and say, oh, this is a nuisance. What is that black stuff? What was that? Anybody? What do you think it was? Crude oil, water. So paraffin found a, a way to <laughs> use that, and 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 process engineers are always thinking of making good use of things that otherwise would be oh what's that you know so um, this is what happened after that crude oil and from crude oil. It's not just about getting crude oil, but it's also to make use of every single product you can get from crude oil. So, this is crude. This is where the moonshiners helped us. How many of you know what moonshine is? Ah, how many of you have tried it? No, no, anyway. Okay, so, so the distillation, they were actually brought in to actually advise on how to process this crude oil to get the different products. Okay. Have you heard of vapor pressure? Maybe not. It's the pressure to become vapor. Okay. So if you have a substance, it's constantly trying to free itself. It's like everybody sitting here might run out. Okay. So there's a certain vapor pressure in here that, um, let's say, if there's a fire, okay, all the molecules will start going, ah, oh, start running out. Okay? So like that, 
in the material, there's a certain amount of energy you can put into that material and it starts to vaporize. So you can change that phase. And, and um, crude oil has got so many different products in it. Adding energy in it, what kind of energy? That's something you learn in this course. It's not just about heat. I'll tell you about that a little later. So, yeah, him, him exactly. He's the one who helped us. Okay, so you get different products, okay, all based on vapor pressure. Okay, you heat something up, and the and the ones with the highest <coughs> vapor pressure, the most easiest to escape, goes to the top, and the heavier ones stay below. And you get all these different products. And you can, make, uh, you can make lots of plastic bags for supermarkets. But um, you, you can make all these different materials, right? So controlling energy is a big um, uh, attribute that we, we want our engineers to be able to, to look at energy and say, OK, I'm going to control it. So, you would see in a plant, for example, okay, so a different product. This is a really old picture. How many of you know what this is? <laughs> this is, I, I need to change this picture. Anyway, timer, oh, timer. So, so you have yeah, complex, again, flow diagrams. They look complex, but in this course, you learn about different things. Like for example, the, the catalyst that I use. So what is a catalyst? People have done some science here. What's a catalyst? Matchmaker? No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. And, and so a catalyst helps in a chemical process without really getting involved, right? And what it does is it provides chemical, it helps to provide extra chemical energy. So you don't have to use so much other types of energy. Okay. So, so trying to find the right catalyst, how to use it, helps us extract more from the crude oil than we would have been able to if we just considered, say, heat. In, in, in this course as well, we, we, we are very industry focused, so our, our, our students go on plant visits we, and we go to places like Methanex and down to Shell, we, uh, Marsden Refinery up, uh, up north, so lots of plant visits and, and interaction. Okay, let's move to another subject, milk. It's a nice old picture, the good old days, the good old days. <coughs> this is... Um, Maybe this is unintentional. It's not supposed to be like all women doing this kind of work. I, I, you know. <laughs> this is this is a nice picture. What can you? This is a neat trick. You you tie the legs at the back so that the cow can't run. You know, and you can get that milk. This is this is um, uh, innovation, innovation. But milk processing, okay, it's a big thing here. Um, just like with other types of food processing, it's, it's really to allow us to keep food um, from going bad, allow us to, to run a business where we can transport food all over the world. So, so if, if there's this milk that's coming out and you want to transport a lot to the rest of the world, you don't want to be carrying the weight of water, for example. So what do you do? You dry it out get into a powder. So there's a lot of science that goes into that. And, and um, we, we have a lot of our students that end up working in Fonterra as well. Uh, this is uh, for, for preparing um, powdered milk. So the whole process flow diagram again. So process flow diagrams about changing phases of materials is, is, is um, uh, something that, that you learn in, in, in this course. Filtration. How many of you are passionate about cleaning our water? Uh, yeah. So, not covered in this talk, uh, the type of uh, 
uh, not just the courses, but the research that's going on in uh, membrane filtration to actually clean, clean up the water. And um, some of the hormones that are in the water, these are really, really tiny particles. So we need special methods to actually remove them. That's not just by natural, just by filtration. So, so the advanced science that's going on um, um, is, 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 is something that, that we enjoy doing in our department. Um, yeah, so ultra high temperature, you all know about, you've heard about this. And um, here's where, so like I said, the department is a chemical and materials engineering department. There actually, there's actually a talk on materials engineering later on by my colleague. Um, so we teach not just the chemical engineering degree, but we reinforce it with a lot of materials um, content as well, as we find that it's useful to know more about the materials. So for example, in another <coughs> school in New Zealand that shan't be named but rhymes with Waterbury, they have a chemical and process engineering degree. So, so ours is a chemical and materials engineering degree and process is part of what we teach, but, but we think that the materials aspect is useful for our students. So here's an, a great example of how materials together with processing uh, is used to create a good product uh, or a better product. Okay. Layers of polyethylene. So we, we have people teaching polymers, um, ceramics, advanced ceramics. Actually, 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 I think I have another slide. Oh, wait. Anybody knows what this animal is? It's a civet cat. A civet-minded cat, <laughs> civet cat. So a civet cat is a cat. It's not a cat. It's an animal found in Southeast Asia. And what does it do? Oh. It, eats it eats coffee beans. And then, what do humans do? They extract it from the poop. Yes, we go through their poop. <laughs> so this symbiotic relationship between human and civet cat you know, to produce the most expensive coffee in the world. <coughs> so we, we have one, one academic who's trying to reproduce that process, the civet process, <laughs> in the lab. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, but that's what turns us on. We like think, of it, oh, wow, how does it do it? You know, OK. Let's try it. So, so we do things like that. Yeah, you're a bit nuts. Um, someone's working on, 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 on the waste, crab shells, mussel shells. What's, what's, what's in the oh, bone, human body, bone, has got a ceramic hydroxyapatite. Now, ceramic, if you, have a, if you have a ceramic cup and you throw it to the ground, what happens? It breaks, right? Shatters, it's brittle. <coughs> Why don't, uh, like, you know, if I fall to the ground, my bones don't just shatter. Because it's got an organic material in there, the collagen, that provides that toughness. So if the ceramic, the hydroxyapatite, was on its own, it would just shatter. But with the collagen, it, you know, provides toughness. So crab shells, same thing. A lot of these creatures in the world, they have that same component. It might be a slightly different chemical, but the same idea of some kind of ceramic and an organic material. So we extract all of that and we try to make artificial bone. So that material doesn't go to waste. Okay? So that's, that, these are things that, uh, why is this? Oh, yes. This is, this is we, we, the bones of cows. What happens to the bones of cows? We have so many cows goes to fertilizer, etc. We can get value. We can take those, that bone, process it, and use it as graph material to replace lost bone in, in humans. So that's something else that's going on as well as research. Tissue engineering is something we do in our department as well. Again, it's that blend of materials and process engineering, and it allows us to actually create a lot of new technology. 
And that's what you learn in this. So really, you know, solve problems in everyday living, but optimum use of the world's limited resources, that's a, a, a strong point that we try to teach our students. Um, scale up, something you discover in the lab, bring it to a large scale where it can be used. That, that's the, the mantra. Um, and then adding value to products, okay? Uh, quickly, diverse range of applications, medicine, en energy, food, water, manufacturing. All this time I've been looking there when I could just look at the screen here. Ah, okay, medicine, energy, food, water, manufacturing, environmental health and safety, biotechnology, mining, exploration. So lots of, lots of our graduates, they work in all these areas. Um, and our curriculum will cover materials, heat and mass transfer, properties of fluids, Thermodynamics, everyone's favorite, and kinetics, materials performance, separation processes, those are those membranes, etc. Unit operations, you know, those flow diagrams that you saw earlier on, all those things. Uh, advanced materials, um, design. Design is a word that you hear in all the talks. It's really about creative, innovative solutions, coming out with innovative solutions to problems. Process control, so it's about control. It's not just, I'm just going to throw a bunch of heat into the problem. How much? Right? So it's all control. Control. <laughs> and economics. Um, you will learn about nanotechnology, energy and the environment, food science, and process engineering. Lots of application to food uh, engineering. High temperature process energy engineering and materials, food and bioproduct processing, separation and reaction engineering, surface and material science, biomaterials. Okay, pretty diverse, but um, so we are accredited internationally by the Institute of Chemical Engineers at the master's level, our four-year degree. Um, so we are chemical and materials engineering department, but our chemical engineering degree is fully accredited uh, by, by this UK body. And uh, our focus has always been on, on enabling our students to make an impact in the problems concerning water, energy, food, health and well-being. Okay. Uh, this is from the NZ website, um, and it looks like um, we are, that there still a very high demand for chemical engineers, so our numbers have been increasing every year. Uh, some famous, you've got to show these slides, who are some famous? Invest Everybody says they invented the post-it note, but Arthur Fry invented it, he's a chemical engineer. Francis Arnold um, uh, on, on enzymes, again, that whole catalysis, um, um, science behind catalysis and enzyme, uh, it, it, so enzyme revolution. Enzymes are catalysts, right? Everybody knows that? <laughs> enzymes, biological catalysts. Okay. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Um, Gore-Tex, chemical engineer. Okay, so that's, that's the end of this talk. Any questions? No, no questions? <coughs> yes? So how many, uh, per year, how many students take into the department? How many of them are chemical, how many of them are Ah, so it's a chemical materials engineering <laughs> department, so we take them all into that department, and they all do the same degree. Um, one, about 1,000 students enter first year. It's a common year. And then, from that first year, students then decide which degree they want to do. In chemical and materials engineering, in our department, we take about 85 every year in the second year. And, you know, second, third, fourth year, are the years where the student specializes, whether it's civil, mechanical, chemical materials. So the, the, that those thousand students get sort of streamed into, and, and it's all based on choice, what, what one, one wants to do. Yeah. Yes? Having chosen chemical engineering, once you're in the course, is there much choice, or is the all students are pretty much the same? So within the, so the, the second year is very fundamental. You, you learn, uh, so again, second, third, and fourth years. Second year, you, uh, the students learn a lot of basics, uh, the fluid mechanics, the thermodynamics, all that kind of stuff. As you go to third and fourth year, the student starts to get opportunities to choose electives. 
So a student may be more fascinated with materials and starts to choose, hey, I want to do electronic materials, I want to do biomaterials, and start to choose those selectives. Uh, some student may, may be uh, wanting to choose some of the food engineering type courses. So the third and fourth years is where, where you start to get the uh, opportunity to choose electives in the department. And, and in, in each elective, we have about 40, 50 students. So, you know, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good chance, that, in fact, um, there's, there's, there's never been an issue about getting into those electives. Then the fourth year, you have this research project experience. So it's a, it's a whole year where you choose what kind of research you want to do. So if you're passionate about tissue engineering, for example, you, you choose a project and work with a research supervisor, one of the academic staff, on a tissue engineering project. So, so it's, a, it's a gradual from fundamentals in the second and a little bit more in the third year to uh, more electives and <coughs> open-ended experiences with like research. And there's a person that's called chemical or material engineering depending on the fourth year projects? No. So when someone comes out, um, we have students working as a chemical, even if they've done a materials engineering project, because the degree is a chemical engineering degree, you can apply and work in jobs in chemical engineering. But at the same time, we have students working in materials engineering companies as well. So um, uh, it's, it, it doesn't restrict you in any way. Yeah. Companies usually want to eventually train their own students. So they just want to see that students have been um, applying themselves well during the second, uh, their first, second, third, fourth years. Grades is one way of looking at it, but it's also how a student enjoys that experience in the fourth four years, the kind of courses they've taken and how they've learned from it. But the, the ultimate application in the end, sure, you know, when, if, if let's say Methanex <coughs> wants to hire an engineer for their plants, they won't, they won't hire an electrical engineer, let's put it that way. They will, they will want somebody with a relevant background. But the specific courses you've taken the degree, um, like the electives, will not impact the kind of job that you get. It is the degree that you get that matters. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. So this tissue engineering, yes. is that sort of like the welcome of some Yeah, they're, they're, so there's different scales. We, we have one staff member that's uh, developing proteins. Yes. So these proteins uh, act on surfaces and they can influence cells to attach to a surface. Then we have another group that's working on a larger scale, the tissue itself. They're growing scaffolding. So these are, uh, this is a matrix, a matrix. This, this is a matrix that you can, uh, that's large scale, you know, you, um, they're not, they're not uh, microscopic. It's a matrix that you can actually put in the body and cells will come in and start doing it. So different scales. Uh, we have someone who's uh, using bio-ink to 3D print um, tissue. So, so is, there, is there any sponsorship from or is this a, Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so the research um, is usually sponsored by, well, they're different, you know, we have grant bodies, the uh, Royal Society gives us money to do research. Uh, the Medical Research Foundation gives us money to do research. So yes, they're, they're MBIE, the ministry, so that there's, there's one staff member who's got a product that is on the verge of commercialization. Then we have the ministry coming in and giving money to do research as well. Yeah. Yes. If you chose an engineer this way, much choice to take subjects that aren't engineering? Yes, um, the, there is some general engineering <coughs> subjects that you can take. I believe it's only just one or two. However, you can also be a conjoint student. Have you all heard of the conjoint system where you, where you can do the engineering degree and also say do a arts degree? Um, you can also take a minor in another degree. So there's nothing stopping you from doing other things. 
But within the degree itself, there is some limitation on the number of non-engineering subjects you're required to take. You can take it, of course, but for it to count towards the degree, um, there's a limitation. Anything else? Okay, so you might want to um, make your way to the... So we have a display where the candy plot is. Yeah.